Good morning, church. Good morning. Today, at last, we begin our Lenten series titled, Roll Down Justice. Say, Roll Down Justice. Roll Down Justice. This series was carefully, cre uh, carefully created through a collaboration between the gifted liturgies of Marsha McPhee, the beautiful music of Mark Miller, both of whom we've experienced before, and the poetry of Bishop Latrell Miller Easterland. It was inspired by Mark Miller's music and the small group curriculum by the same name, put together by the General Commission on Religion and Race, a general agency of the United Methodist Church. When our worship committee sat down together this winter to start considering what our congregation was most thirsty for, spiritually right now, we felt that this was it. We have a deep-seated thirst for justice in our country now, amen? Amen. Both on the right and the left. Praise God. The presidential election period and the season <laughs> since have revealed in our country the long tendled feelings of marginalization among those who feel that their livelihood has been stripped from them, as well as those who now feel the target on their back has grown larger than usual, simply because of who they are or where they came from. As it always has, politics has aroused and catered to our sense of injustice in such a way that proponents of each side feel justified in their position and the media has succeeded in solidifying our feelings of us versus them. And yet, as those who seek justice through the way of Jesus Christ, we are following some very different guidelines. As those who put God before our opinions, political leanings, artificial boundaries, and sense of what the world owes me, we have quite a divergent standard by which we need to make our decisions. All of these other allegiances must be held up to the standard of Jesus' teaching and example to determine if they are leading us astray or in the right way. My prayer for this study, then, is that as we talk with one another, not as people of one camp or another, but as people of a common journey, to let God's sense of justice have its way in the world, as those knocking on the doors of God's kingdom and hoping to join the dance inside. As we begin, then, let us remember the promise of Jesus. Ask, and you will receive. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Lord Jesus, your people are thirsty for that justice that rolls down like water, for that righteousness which comes like an ever-flowing stream. We are knocking loudly on the gates of heaven this morning, Jesus, and we beg you to help us on this sacred journey for the equity we yearn to see in this world. As we sing your praises, as we study your word, as we receive a foretaste of your broadening heavenly kingdom, give us a vision of the sacredness of one another and the courage to set aside our fears and embrace the kingdom you yearn to give us. For the glory of God and the fulfillment of the promise you have shared with all your children throughout the ages, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Our journey for justice begins now with a passage from Romans 8. Romans constitutes Paul's summarizing work. It represents a compilation of his theology. In it, he provides chapter 8 as an encouragement for those who are oppressed, living in close proximity to those in power at the very heart of the Roman Empire. They, more than any other, might have the opportunity to teach those in authority about the love of God that would also serve to sustain the readers of Paul's letter. Paul reminds his Christian readers to stand firm against those who would oppress them, reminding them that as God's children, they are heirs of the promise of God's shalom. As it says in chapter 8, verse 17, that same spirit agrees with our spirit, that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. Those who are baptized by God's spirit have become children of the Most High God, and no one can take that away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No Roman soldier, no magistrate, no tax collector, no cantankerous next-door neighbor. None of them can take that beautiful baptismal identity away from them. This is what God means when God says, I have called you by name, you are mine. Though you walk through the waters, I will be with you. Somebody thank God with a clap offering this morning. That's right, Paul wanted to remind them that if God is for us, who is against us? He didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Won't he also freely give us all things with him? No one can successfully bring a charge against God's children because God is the judge. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And our lawyer, 
talk about a committed lawyer. He has already shown that he's willing to die on the cross to plead our case. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. So the prosecutor doesn't stand a chance against God's children, as long as all God's children are willing to see it through. Paul is sure that the prosecutor will pull out all the stops against us. Trouble, distress, harassment, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Yeah, we've seen those. But Paul has already told us that these things can't separate us from Christ's love. In fact, nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death nor life, not angels or rulers, not things present or future things, not powers or height or depth or any other thing that is created. But if this is so, then we need to ask ourselves an important question. If no one can separate us from the love of God, then why do we keep trying to indict one another? Why do we keep sending the message to one another that some of our spiritual brethren are children of our father or mother, while others are not? You know, once in a while my children will say to the other, that's my dad. <laughs> it seems to me that if we really believe what it says in our baptismal liturgy, that Christ has opened the church to people of all ages, nations, and races, then we've been playing at some serious sibling rivalry issues throughout human history. Amen? Kind of like one adopted child telling her sister, who's also adopted, that isn't your real mom, she's mine. <coughs> or it's like a son who's jealous over his brother not giving up a toy. He smashes a lamp, then calls his dad and pretends his brother pushed him into it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I never did anything like that. <laughs> I'm sure that somebody did. Right, Mom? <laughs> You know, I'm glad we can laugh at ourselves because, like all good comedy, there's a painful truth at the core of it. Cats have 82% of their genes in common with dogs. So whether you're a cat person or a dog person, you're really arguing about the last 18%. <laughs> As for people, well, human beings share about 60% of our DNA with a fruit fly and 50% half of our DNA with a banana. Yeah. So, yet one human being can vary only as much as 0.5% from another. And yet that small sliver was enough for my high school self to drive a truck through. For a while I hung out with some smart people. You know the type. The ones that think they know everything and that no one quite measures up to their standard. I remember sitting on a windowsill of a classroom and laughing at just how inferior others were. And when I think of it now, I get so angry with myself for being so prideful that I would even for a moment begin to think myself superior to someone else both infuriates my soul and shows me how potent God's grace really is. God's grace opened my eyes by planting me among people that were different from me, and in doing so, God revealed to my heart just how wonderful God's people of every shade and culture could be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I need to watch myself. Because I've noticed how that same ugly sentiment creeps into my thinking in subtle ways now and again. It is so much easier, church, to exclude than to include. It's simpler to decide that someone is not worth your time or energy or even to be treated well. It's so much easier to consider someone an enemy rather than a potential friend. It produces less mental anguish to neatly box someone up into categories that distance us from them. Communities, churches, schools, even families can incarnate these tendencies more easily than including everybody else. It takes work to lift the oppressed to their feet, to make spaces for people of various abilities, and to treat people with equity. Yet this is exactly what Christ told us that he was, had come to do when he quoted Isaiah in his own church. However, the easy way was not what Jesus embodied for us. He went well beyond the societal boundaries of his time. He touched the lepers. He maneuvered women closer to his inner circle than his contemporaries, empowered them, and relied on their support day after day. He gave voice to Israel's xenophobia towards Samaritans and showed how it no longer served God's purpose. He practiced forgiveness towards those who meant him harm, even when they succeeded. In every relationship, Jesus invited his neighbors to put down their magic boxes and take up the mission of a shepherd's staff instead, to care for one another 
as God has loved you. So take a moment now to consider in your heart anyone you may have participated in excluding. Just bring them before God right now in your mind and ask your Savior how you might deal more equitably with them. <coughs> how might you include them or others exclude them? How could you let them know that they too are a child of God?